Good day and welcome to the Massac Report. I am your host, Carl Bodner. For this broadcast, we will debate the growing issue involving screen addiction. We have two guests who will share their thoughts and ideas about this issue. Our guests are Samantha Goldfarb, a member of the Massac Free Press staff, at, and Mrs. Tracy Forstrom, a member of the Massac English Department, who is also a mom for two young children. Ours will be an open forum for conversation so each of our guests can freely respond and comment on ideas being shared across the table. There are four questions I will pose to facilitate our discussion. Both guests will be invited to respond to each question. My first question is to ask each of you if you agree with Victoria Dudley, who says in her article about gray matters, studies prove that the average child spends seven hours of screen time per day suffer sensory overload and lack of restorative sleep. That's 56 hours a week. So, Samantha, Mrs. Forstrom, what would you like to add and comment on that? Well, I think that it's interesting. You don't really get to think a lot about seven and a half or seven and a half hours of screen time a day, and it's everything from the classic TV and smartphones and iPads, but also smart boards even. I mean, I guess that counts as screen time. And I think it's interesting that we're incorporating this into education in such a way. I never really thought of it as detrimental, possibly. Absolutely. You're, I, you know what? You bring up a great point. I hadn't even thought about the aspect of, as a teacher, what it is that I ask my students to do in front of the screen and that that would add to what this doctor is saying is, on average, seven hours of screen time a day. I first read that statistic and thought, I mean, my own children are small. I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old, and they have limited screen time. Um, however, the students that I see every day here at, at Massac are high school juniors, and I, I even thought for them that was a staggering amount of time, seven hours. Oh, yeah. But if you add up TV time, you add up time on their phones, um, in front of a computer, uh, she's probably right. Well, I think it's a matter of looking at it cumulatively, which we tend not to do. Because in addition to what you both have said, I mean, when we walk the halls, 80% of all the students we see are looking downward. Yes. Mm -hmm. As soon as they get in the room, that screen is out. They may be doing a game. They may be looking at Facebook. I mean, this is an interesting social habituation, if we don't want to call it an addiction, mm -hmm. but it's very life-consuming. And so what might be some of the long-term effects? You know, what will this mean? And I, you know, I want to be careful about this because in education and in society in general, we tend to all focus criticisms on young people. Mm -hmm. But I would make the argument that adults are probably at least close to equaling, if not equaling, that mm -hmm. seven hours. Well, as a young person, what do you think? Well, I think that a lot of, like, especially little children, they learn from the adults around them. So, and teenagers, if it wasn't really, I mean, a teenager wouldn't be able to just go to an Apple store and buy an iPhone and a plan with their own money. So I believe there's a lot of adult aiding in this. I don't think they could have done it all by themselves. So mm. the adults are guilty of facilitating? I think unconsciously. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely think that. I have a husband who is a tech nerd. Um, he works in tech all day. When he comes home, he's on his computer, he's on his phone. Um, I have children who have access to iPads and ask mm -hmm. to play with our phones all the time. Um, and like I said, while we limit that, just the mere fact that they ask for it, it's, mm -hmm. it's that they see a parent not me, <laughs> mm -hmm. but they see a parent in the house who is constantly around technology and is always using technology, and so it's sort of second nature to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, Apple jumped on this very early. It was several years ago when they started creating applications for toddlers. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yes. while there are, there are, I have to say, because I do have small children, um, there are good apps out there for, for kids, but not all apps take the place of the one-on-one -on -one interaction a parent can have with a child or a teacher can have with a child or even a babysitter can have with a child. They can teach the same things even more effectively in person with real FaceTime um, and not FaceTime on your phone. <laughs> um, but 
in the real world. I can agree with that. Like special needs apps. Um, my cousin, well, my second cousin has severe Down syndrome, and she has an iPad with apps that allow, that help her cognitive thinking and things like that. But I'm not sure whether that actually it helps more than seeing someone about that. I mean, it allows her to practice more often, but does it really give the same? I'm not really sure. Right. That whole human sensory mm -hmm. interaction is, uh, I think, what you're both referring to. And I think corporations and business in general, including the education business, really fosters both you and I as teachers to spend a lot of screen time, keep the mm -hmm. students involved in a lot of screen time, and I'm wondering in the long run, are we failing to nurture uh, what might be the better communication skills that mm -hmm. we groom when we have face-to-face? -face? Right. Well, I think in some of the research that we've conducted while preparing for this segment, we've read about the detriment of screen time, mm -hmm. um, as well as benefits. But one of those detriments that is mentioned in these articles um, again and again is that with a lack of face-to-face -face communication, we learn our, so we, we sort of unlearn social skills and we don't practice them. And young children don't even learn them the first time around if they're only sitting with a screen in front of them. And so then we see people sort of pulling away, becoming more isolated. Um, when they're put in social situations, they don't necessarily know how to respond appropriately. Um, and it's intriguing to me with your cousin, I believe you mm -hmm. said, with Down syndrome, um, the fact that that app is coming in because it would be important for everybody, but probably especially for your cousin to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction and that social um, support. I can, I can agree with that. I especially think that, I think this is one of these science in progress things where mm -hmm. because we can do something, we automatically do it. So I'm not saying that iPhones or this new technology that we have all the screen time is bad, but I'm saying that we're too enthusiastic and our children and the, the young people, like the really young people, they're growing up not knowing what it was like. I mean, even when I was little, my dad, um, he didn't, I mean, he didn't have an iPhone. It was, yeah, but my sister, for example, my dad's had an iPhone for it since she was born. And then my mom got one and I got one and her friends have iPads and it goes on and they don't really get to see what it was like. and They don't have that same experience. So virtual becomes the substitution for actual. Mm. I don't know about that. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> well, let's move to my second question. Further studies show that this many hours of screen time create processing atrophy in the insular section of the brain, altering a person's capacity for experiencing empathy and compassion. I mean, that is shocking to me. Mm. Uh, maybe because I believe compassion is so essential mm. in human interaction, but what, what are your thoughts on that question? Mm. Well, to me, I mean, I may be jumping the gun a bit on here, but the first thing that comes out to me is autism. And I notice I have, a, I have another cousin with autism, but he spends a lot of time with screens and it makes sense because he doesn't have to do the things that are hard for him. And it, I wonder if this might actually hurt him more than it helps if this is the real thing. I mean, the, one of the articles we were talking about um, says that there was a study done where students d had an outdoor camp with no technology and they got far better at recognizing their other people's expressions and things like that. So just right. interesting. Thing. Well, one of the um, Psychology Today articles that you provided for us, it read like a litany of all of the things that can happen to you. Um, with too much screen time. I mean, gray matter atrophy and compri uh, compromised white matter integrity, uh, reduced cortical thickness. I mean, all these technical terms for we're doing something significant to our brains. And so as shocking as this might be that we are losing our ability to empathize and to feel compassion for one another, you read articles like this and say, well, yes, of course, if they are seeing on brain scans that things are happening as we increase the screen time. I mean, it right. makes sense, but... Screen time uh, doesn't help us learn how to, uh, or experience how to learn from tone of voice, mm -hmm. hand gestures, body language, tilts of the head, eye movements. Agreed. 
this, this is all essential in terms of our own humanity if we're going to have any kind of compassionate sense for each other. And I'm not so sure just saying, hey, uh, let's Skype and we'll call that really being face to face. <laughs> yeah, especially because like, I know a lot of young people play video games and that you can't sympathize with people in video games because if you ever brought that up, people would say that's weird because they don't exist. And if you spend seven and a half hours a day, I think we said, with things, people in a sense, you can't sympathize with instead of people you can. I mean, I can completely see how that would just end strangely. Yeah, and I, and I worry about that empathy factor. I'm not, I know there's, there's a definite difference between sympathy and empathy. I really sure. worry about that empathy factor. What about you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you cited the study, Samantha, of the, the young students who went out into the wilderness and their technology was taken away and, and they, we saw great growth um, from that. Um, I was just thinking about, you know, the, the simple fact of you take the technology away um, at any point, at any stage in development, and you force people to have one-on-one -on -one contact, it may be more awkward, especially if you've spent more time behind a screen, mm -hmm. um, but eventually people will figure it out because they'll respond to each other and, you know, mm -hmm. it'll be positive or negative, and if it's negative, they'll learn from the negative. I think, though, that the push with screen time is probably, you know, especially as teachers, Mr. Bodner, um, we are encouraged to use technology um, as long as that technology has a great benefit to, mm -hmm. to you as students. Um, it, should, it should provide something extra, an added bonus. Um, and in businesses today, in, in the world of work, technology is so important. It's essential. It drives what we're doing most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but for us to be able to collaborate, which is key, right? People to people contact, um, working together to, towards a common goal. For us to be able to do that, even in the world of work, we need to have the foundation of being able to empathize and, be, and have compassion and communicate effectively with one another. And if, imagine if we took kids from a very young age and just sat them in front of a screen even if they were able to communicate across the screen, there's no body language to read, there's no facial expressions mm -hmm. to interpret, there's no tone of voice to hear. And so we miss out on 90% of the communication that is all nonverbal. And, and so if we don't have that foundation rooted in human to human contact and face to face um, interaction, you're, it's not going to matter later on if we're communicating via computers or Skype or FaceTime or whatever. It will, it will all have been lost already. For some crazy reason, one thought caught, shot in my head that the movie they made about the guy that fell in love with his computer. Did you ever hear about that? No. Have you heard about that? <laughs> no. I wish I could remember the title. I think it's just called She, but you know, it's, it sounds bizarre, but it makes an indescribable mm -hmm. statement. You might want to investigate that. Oh, I've heard something kind of similar to this. I was listening to Radio Lab, and they were talking about humans and machines, and how um, I believe someone entered a dating site as a and was used the robot as a Russian lady, and a guy was uh, communicating with her and fell in love with her and found out she was a robot, <laughs> and it's just really, really interesting. I don't know. Yeah. In, in Japan, they're selling robots to be playmates with children and also be babysitters. And That's the, interesting. the robot has a camera set up on it, so while you're at work, you can have an app and you can go check on that. That's scary. And yeah. uh, in, in uh, a Dutch experimenter, just for fun, thought, well, what if he put a mobile over a cri crib where if the child hits whatever, the little teddy bear, it snaps a selfie of the baby. And it turned out people wanted to buy that product because during the day they could check and say, oh, look, Samantha's selfie right here. <laughs> so I don't know. There's, there's That's a whole other discussion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a bit of humor to all of <laughs> yeah. this. All right, let's go to our next question. It seems that evidence indicates that excessive cre screen time creates an increase in the production of dopamine in the brain, similar to what happens with gambling. You know, especially when you go to some of these places in, what do you call them, uh, slot machines? And uh -huh. people can sit there and, and lose track for hours and hours. Now, of course, they're in an environment where there's intentionally no windows and no clocks. Mm -hmm. But 
<laughs> that, you know, it's not just the winning they're after, it's the sensation of hitting the button or pulling the lever. And I guess that gives them a sense of joy. I don't know, I've never been interested in it. But, um, but what are your thinking? Uh, Samantha, why don't you kick us off for here? What's your thinking about that? Well, I can kind of understand. I mean, I assume, I mean, dopamine release in the brain is generally triggered, I believe, by exciting activity and rewards. So there's a slot machine, and you're waiting, you're excited, it's colorful, and a reward comes out sometimes. <laughs> um, in, uh, in, in, it's the same thing with drugs. You know, you take drugs, because that's where drug addiction comes in, too, with the dopamine, you get hooked on that. For screen time, I can kind of see where it'd be the same thing. It's colorful, there's sometimes a reward, you beat something, it's the same reason we all like Flappy Bird, and, or whatever new thing is coming out now, but I can completely understand where this is coming from. It's just scary. Well, what else scares me is so much of what that you refer to is also exceedingly violent. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the thrill is coming out of witnessing this virtual slaughter. Oh, yeah. Sure. I've always found that really scary where I work at a Girl Scout camp during the summer and little girls will come and tell me about how their brothers play Halo or something. And I just find it so frightening that so many people sit in front of a screen and essentially, to their brains, shoot people for fun. That mm. scares me a lot. Absolutely. Now, what, thinking as a parent, not just a teacher, what is your reaction to this? That's horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, I, I could say... I mean, it really targets little boys. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and I have one of each. My daughter is seven, my son is four, and my son will ask about once a week if he, we can turn on the Wii and play. And, um, you know, we're playing silly little things, you know, Super Mario Brothers mm -hmm. and things like that, that, um, you know, we sit there with him, my husband and I play with him. Actually, his favorite playmate with video games is his grandma. Um, oh, so wow. he and grandma play video games together. It's a, it's a, it's a nice <laughs> uh, activity for them. Um, and I'm hoping that it doesn't ever go in that direction. Yeah. I would never buy those video games oh, because no. Um, despite what people say, um, it, as far as your brain is concerned, it's got to be real mm -hmm. to some extent. And, um, you know, I watch it how dexterous he is with playing the game and he doesn't have questions and he can navigate through better than I even can. So the thought of him navigating through this fake world with the intent of purposely trying to seek people out to kill them or to, yeah. you know, steal their cars or to live some other alternative life yeah, in great. there. Theft auto or right. Something. Yeah. Um, it's always seemed crazy to me. <laughs> but, you know, there has to be some benefit to all of it. People don't do things that don't benefit them for the most part. They do things because they, they get some kind of reward. You know, we donate um, to people that don't have things because it makes us happy. We, we um, do things for our own benefit and for our own, you know, we buy that new pair of shoes because we want it and it makes us feel good. We rarely will do things that don't have a fringe benefit. So clearly with the number of people that are doing this, oh yeah, there must be happy oh, yeah, chemicals mm -hmm. pumping through everybody's brains. And I, I'm, I'm gonna guess, or I'm gonna claim that the phenomena of taking selfie on top of selfie on top of selfie uh -huh. is, is only making us more narcissistic in terms oh. of wanting this sense of self-reward. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of makes me nervous. And then we turn and we say, we. We don't just take our own pictures, but then we compliment everybody else on their pictures, and <laughs> everybody puts everything out onto the internet like it all, like it all matters. <laughs> well, I've seen myself in pictures, and I don't need any excess <laughs> pictures. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's take a look at this. What constitutes good screen time? The American Academy of Pediatrics says that preschool children should be exposed to only two hours a day, and under two years of age, none. Is this realistic when children grow up witnessing their parents frequently engaged with screen time, even when driving? Mm -hmm. So what do you think, Samantha? Well, I think, I think there's two aspects. I think that it would be very, very good because the small child's brain is still is developing at that point. And for them to have a lot of face-to-face -face interaction, I could see that being very good because they have that programmed into their brains. You know, as it grows, it grows, they, they grow with it. 
and but I also think that it would take a lot of effort for the parents part like it may be realistic if the parents are willing to get off of their cell phones during dinner time or in basically if they applied this to themselves maybe if they had hardly any screen time when their children were that little and it grew with them then it may help I don't know what do you think well I can speak on this one exactly from experience um, I can say that it is realistic I think um, some parents have gotten lazy. I said mm -hmm. it, you know. <laughs> um, I've been horrified at the park sometimes where kids are running around, they're climbing all, and if they're climbing like my kids are, they are in imminent danger because they are at the top of everything. But, um, you know, the, the mom or the dad is sitting over on the side on their screen and not paying attention. And it's, it's scary uh, pushing the carriage and checking on their phone and and it's not just the quick oh I got a text message it could be something important or something came up and and I'm waiting for something it's the sustained like you said it sucks you in and holds you there for a while and stuff can be going on and, and I don't know about you but you sort of tune everything else out and you're sucked in for a little while and you lose all track of who you are and what's going on around you well I, I think it's like an electronic cocoon yes that analogy can work you know and uh, in, a, in many cases, what are we seeing? People are using their phones. The least usage is for a phone. Texting right. has dominated everything. And, you know? right. and I think that electric cocoon can actually be dangerous, especially, as you said, pushing the baby carriage, the children at the park. And, like, it mm -hmm. is dangerous because if you're trapped in that electric cocoon, there are children that need you to pay attention. Yes. And if, God forbid, they get hurt and you can't save them because you were playing candy crush or something that's just terrible and then also there's the the just the fact that you miss out you'll miss out mm -hmm. as a parent the time goes so quickly that if you know if you are addicted to your phone at whatever screen it is your computer your tv screen you will miss out on priceless moments that will never happen again mm -hmm. and moments make a big difference in life i would argue but let me go to our final question. Let's consider what Brad Zacuto, head of Westside Neighborhood School, says. He says, offering preschool and elementary children open and encouraged access with screen time activity is like putting a child behind the mm -hmm. wheels of a car. <laughs> Do you think that is an imminent danger? I can definitely agree with that because as children get exposed to screen time they also get exposed to social media and I feel like the more we expose our children to social media the more that they'll be able the earlier they'll get on it their parents will be like well you've been on for so long you know I mean how many when phones were first coming out how many parents would get their 12 year old cell phones mm. now how many parents are getting their seven year old cell phones or their three year old oh yes <sighs> it's just and it's giving them a power they can't hope to control. They may know how to navigate it, but I don't think their brains are developed enough to understand the long-term effects of putting something out there. And the children can't make that decision at all no, for themselves. No, and it's our job as responsible adults, parents or otherwise in the community, to do what's best by them. And with all of these studies, it's clear that limiting their time in front of the screen. I'm not saying totally abolishing it, mm -hmm. but limiting their time. And then when you do give them that time, teaching them how to constructively use it. Like yes. I said before about technology should provide an added bonus. There should be some additional feature that cannot be um, garnered from just regular interaction. There should be something extra and special about it. Um, but I know I could watch my son like I said, play those video games or my daughter could sit on there and read, you know, and while that sounds like a, a constructive activity, at least in her case, um, she could do it for hours and hours and hours at the expense of going outside and playing and mm -hmm. doing other things that she should be doing. And making more utilization out of, and I'm very biased about this, about their imagination. I, mean, I think yes. the one oh, yes. thing we should never stifle is imagination. And I always make the argument that imaginative thinking is intellectualization. Mm -hmm. I, can def know? I can definitely agree with that. I went to a daycare, and I remember there was no, like, there was hardly any. And we, I would, we would go outside for a couple hours a day, and I would just make up stories. Mm -hmm. And we would play things with our friends. To think that this, the young children that's following me, maybe won't get to have that or as much of that it makes me sad and it makes me worry for them.
Wouldn't the irony be that, you know, the Steve Jobs, like, innovators of this world came from a daycare like that, mm -hmm. and yet the world that they are recreating is a world where that innovation and that imagination may fall by the wayside because we're not fostering this imaginative thought. I mean, that scares me seriously. I worry about that. I'm a parent. I'm a grandparent. I've been involved with young people all my adult life all 47 years since I've been 20 years old. And I'm, I'm not anti-phone or anti-game, but I think we have to get some leash on it, mm -hmm. something that Absolutely. allows us to keep it manageable. And I think the tragedy in my prejudice is that, as you indicated, the adults are just as uh, addicted mm -hmm. in their social behavior, so afraid to not be in touch constantly. And businesses foster that. They want that. They want you put your eight hours in at the office, but then give me another hour and a half when sure. you're, you're waiting for your child to swim the 100-meter freestyle. And while the other kids are swimming, don't bother watching them. Get on your phone. Yeah. And I've seen that when I'm working yeah. tickets at swim meets and games and stuff like that. So anyhow, yeah. well, upon those comments, allow me to say thank you to Samantha and Mrs. Forstrom for sharing their thoughts about the impending issues related to the growing concerns regarding the volume of screen time spent by children and apparently adults. And may I just insert one little other thing here. You mentioned about the camp. Mm -hmm. I have a granddaughter who was a counselor in training at Silver Lake up in Litchfield County last summer, and they do that. The children turn in their phones, and there's, they go to one of the counselors if they need to contact mom or something. Mm -hmm. But my granddaughter said they have their best time because they really, like you said with the Girl Scouts, they really become engaged. So on that note, allow me to thank you for joining our broadcast. We at the Massacre Report send you a thanks and look forward to sharing our next show with you. Until then, be well and be safe. <laughs>